Hi, Mike. It's Stephanie and Adrian from the How to Be a Redhead podcast. We're Hi. so excited to talk with you. Hi, it's so nice to meet you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you very, very much for having me. Mike, a question we like to ask all of our guests who are redheads. What was it like for you growing up with red hair? I have so many memories from my childhood as a redhead. And I think that it is defining having red hair. It's mm -hmm. such a, it's just a color of your hair, but it's such a part of my personality because I don't know about you, but for me, growing up as a redhead was kind of hard. Like I got made fun of all the time and I had curly red hair, which like I'm starting to grow it back in. Um, for the first it's time, gorgeous. Life. it we'll is get into gorgeous. It, but it's like color. it's like it's it's stunning. It's it's seriously <laughs> stunning. Yeah, I didn't want you to think I was like hitting on you. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, oh my god, his hair is stunning. It is. It's a color that I wish that I had. Like your vibrancy and the auburnness in your hair. It's so rich. That's very kind. And I I actually relate to what you're saying because when I see redheads in the street now, I'm always like. I almost feel compelled sometimes yeah. to be like, oh, the color is so, because it really is like captivating and special, but mm -hmm. going back to what it wasn't because I was just picked on all the time and I had very curly red hair and I wanted to change it. I wanted to straighten it. I wanted to dye it brown. I wanted to dye it blonde. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be like everybody else. And it was, so, it was so dumb. Like the names that people call you, Carrot Top, mm -hmm. whatever, like it's, it's so silly in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's that's how it was for me growing up. And of course, like all the adults in my life were like, you're crazy. Like, how could you not love this? And like, my parents were so happy to have redheaded kids. My sister is also a redhead. Um, oh. oh, both of you guys. Wow. Yeah, we're really lucky. And I'm, you know, we're well, I'm sure we'll get to this, but I'm like hoping that we end up with some red hair in our family line, too. But we'll see. Yeah, that sounds so exciting. We can't wait to get to that. Yeah. yeah. So who's a redhead? So you and your sister both have red hair. How about parents? Uh, my father. My father has very, okay. very red, very curly hair. There's pictures of him from the 70s uh, with like a massive, like his hair was like bright, bright orange um, fro. Oh, and he wow. has a twin brother. So they both rocked that like big orange fro for a while. Um, but yeah, he's he still has some red. He's 70. He'll be 72. He has still has some red in his hair. Does um, he? But yeah, on my dad's side. Um, but again, like something we'll probably talk about, but all Italian, like we're like 90 yes. something percent Italian. There isn't, we have no Scottish, no Irish. Wow. We don't really know where it comes from. And maybe you all have done some of the research because I truly don't know where it comes from. You know, where's so your family? Weird? Oh, Aiden, Steph, go I was going to say like our family's from Southern Italy. So everyone yeah. who meets us is like, mm -hmm. oh, you must be from Northern Italy. And we're actually working right now to get our Italian citizenship. And I'm like, maybe okay. that for once and for all will like stop people asking if we're Irish. But I think it just comes with the territory. And I don't think even our family has any idea because like our back in like the 1700s, our family like immigrated from Albania. So like maybe like the Greek Albania, like I don't know if it came Baltic, through there. Yeah. But genes would, are weird. I would love to know um, because my mom's side is from Northern Italy, but the red hair is on my dad's side and they're from the South. So right. my dad's my dad's father was from Napoli. His mother's from Bari, which is on the heel. Like That's near, true. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. maybe, we're, maybe we've got some connections there. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe I'm we're related. Going, I'm going in a week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll be in Italy in a week, Northern Italy this time. But Oh, how amazing. You know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, are you going just for pleasure? Like, yeah, just for, so we're hoping to have kids next year. So yeah. this is like our bucket list travel year and a half or so. Um, Italy is up on our list because of my heritage. Alec has never been, my husband has never been to Italy. Um, so I want to take him there and, and show him around and get some good food with him. So we're really yeah, excited. Yeah, do, do it now before kids. I have two <laughs> and they... It's just hard in the beginning to travel and, but yeah, do, you guys are going to have a great time. Thank you. I hope so. Uh, do your, do your kids have red hair? They don't. Well, no, my, my son, he's definitely not. It's brunette. My husband has, is a brunette and, and then my daughter, it's interesting. She was born with dark hair. Like the OB was saying as I was having her, oh, she doesn't have gin. She's not a ginger. And it was a joke in the room. But then as she's gotten older, I don't know if it's 
baby's hair, you know, it's so thin, their hair. So then the scalp when they're outside, I think just naturally gets red or if they are outside and they're getting overheated or whatever. I was at Lowe's and a woman stops me and says, your daughter, your redheaded daughter is so pretty. And it was the first time that I've ever been, you know, that anyone's ever associated Isla's hair with being red. But again, I don't know if it's because we were outside, it was hot. She had a hat on, but she kept throwing it off. So I don't know, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, Mike, I, you know, fingers crossed for you guys to have a redhead. Yeah, yeah. That's so exciting. So what's, um, and I know we'll talk about your journey with what you and Alec are doing with the surrogacy, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to, I can talk about that for hours and I love talking about it. And I don't think that there are enough, um, gay couples that are talking about the details of it because everyone is there's a little bit of a stigma around uh having a gestational carrier um and you know a lot of countries in europe don't even allow it and then of mm. course the church the catholic church is is has been pretty vocal against it um and then there's also just like the general uncertainties that even straight couples deal with when getting pregnant and you know waiting till 12 weeks and so it's like mm-hmm. for us to be talking about this at the stage where we just have embryos not even a carrier and then we're not even pregnant, like, but I think it's important that people know how complex the process is, how expensive it is. So I, I love talking about it. I'm happy to to get into all the details you want. Yeah, yeah, I know. We we first wanted to, so let's, we love to talk about like the timeline. Okay, so before this exciting part of like you and your husband wanting a baby, you, what inspired you to start creating content? Because you know, your, we know your career began in the White House under Obama. So what has your journey been like to get to where you are now? Yeah, I mean, I think even as a little kid, I was always, like, as soon as I could have a camcorder, I I wanted one to make, like, silly videos. And I loved, like, the mystery and the magic behind, like, special effects and stuff like that. And I used to do, like, little production, you know, my friends would, I would drive my friends crazy with, like, trying to do little productions and theater performances in the house and drag people into, like, making music videos and making, like, you know, fun, you know, movies even, short films. They were all garbage, of course, but um, it was fun to do. <laughs> and <laughs> I think, and I and there was a point in my life where I was, like, I did a lot of theater in middle middle school and high school, so that, like, creative theatrical side of me was always there and I had this director who and no shame to this person but they kind of set up this like false dichotomy for me at some point they were like you are gonna have to choose between theater and Mm. swimming because I was a competitive swimmer and Mm. I wanted to swim in college and that's of course not true like you can do both of those things but I think I like got to this point where it was a lot to juggle and I was like all right well if I really want to excel at something I'm going to, I think I'm going to pick swimming. And so that part of my life kind of went away for a while and it bubbled back up. Like I went to the white house thinking I was going to work in politics and then realized I had a passion for media and journalism Mm -hmm. and then worked at good morning America. And I feel like that was the beginning of like, okay, like being a producer reminded me of what it was like to be like a homemade producer as a kid. And I started to do a little bit more like on Instagram, Um, This was really before like video content was something that I even thought about, but even just like being active on social, I started to do more of that. And then uh, even on like Twitter and, and then um, once I was free, because as a journalist, you really can't do like, you can't do brand deals. You can't endorse a product because if you cover that product, then it could be a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So once I left news, I was free to really, lean into it a little bit more. And it's, it's totally a side hustle. Like I, my primary, I have a career in PR now and I, that's my primary focus, but I just like, I, I make these videos with Alex sometimes and like, I watch them over and over again. Cause they just bring me joy. Like they make me laugh. They make me smile. And some of them are like super honest and some of them are serious. And then some of them are silly and funny. And it's just like, it's just like fun to watch and fun to be a part of. And I think that's how it's kind of grown. Yeah, no, we love, I love your honesty. You seem so relatable. You seem Mm -hmm. like authentic. I think you're doing such a great job with it. And um, I love what you said before about how you feel like a lot of people aren't talking about what you guys are going through. And we loved your recent post about 
saying that you have remaining months as dinks. Love that. Um, because my husband and I were dinks too. And um, so we know, <laughs> but Stephanie is like the person to talk to about having kids too, because she's an amazing mom. Um, oh, you, so you and your husband are expecting to become dads through surrogacy. So how did you decide to do this together? Because I'm mm. sure that had to be a lot of like, you know, that's a conversation, many conversations. Um, but you don't know like the genders yet or do you? Like how, what's the whole process like? Yeah, the process is um, involved and obviously involves a lot of thoughtful conversations. We mm. both knew, we've been together for over 10 years. We got married coming up on four years ago. Oh. But we knew, like we always, we went into dating, knowing that we wanted to have kids someday, whether that was adoption or through a carrier. Um, and we definitely considered adoption. We talked a lot about it. Um, the costs are not that different um, for no. adoption. It can be, it can also be very expensive. Okay. And I'll be transparent. I, the, the Like, I think it can be close, like between like 50 and 100K, for example, to adopt one child. Um, surrogacy yeah. at this stage, you know, all in eggs and a carrier and all the medical costs. And just, they, there's a big range because it, as you can imagine, depending on like which agency you work with, the the carrier's healthcare, your healthcare insurance, all that, it varies. But I think like between like a hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So for, for one baby. Um, wow. But I like to be transparent about that because, like, it's hard to find those numbers out there. And also, I, this is coming at coming from someone who's only halfway through the process. We're like at the embryo stage, but we've been in close conversation with our agency about like the costs and all of that. Mm. So, um, and and you said earlier that you hope to have redheaded kids. So, how, how can you decide if <laughs> if that happens? Well. Only as much as you can, right? I mean, we... True, um, yeah. We, there were a few... So I do want to shout out our agency, Elevate Baby. They're fantastic. They have mm -hmm. been with us since day one, helping us find an egg donor. And they're also... We've also um, partnered with them for the gestational carrier portion of this. Okay. Um, so they do everything from sperm donation to egg donation to um, finding a carrier... Uh, they, they do the match process. They take care of all the legal, which is a huge like headache that we don't have to project manage ourselves. Um, but when we were looking through their database for an egg donor, um, I think like one of the priorities for us was that the babies will look, will have some physical characteristics that are similar to both of us. Okay. Which is tough because Alec is half <laughs> Japanese and Greek very dark features and yeah. I'm a ginger Italian. So it was a challenge. We, there were a few redheads in there, but some of the other things in their profile, we just, they, they just didn't match up. And, and obviously like we we're looking at like health history for their families as well. It was very important. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like they, they answer a questionnaire. So you get a sense of like their personality. Are they a good person? Are they kind? Are they reasonably intelligent. Mm -hmm. um, all those things were factors. And at the end of the day, we ended up choosing a donor who is also half Asian. Um, her grandmother is European and has red hair, at least according to her family history. Chart. Oh, wow. So that is our like little hope that maybe her one recessive line and mine will give us one or more redheaded kids. Wow. Um, but, you know, seeing as my sister married a brunette, um, their, their two kids, it looks like both of their kids will be brunettes. Uh, she has two little girls. The most recently born one is only four months and she has still has dark hair, but we'll see. I mean, sometimes it can, it can sometimes change. Sometimes it can change. Yeah. yeah. I know. I actually know a redhead who was born with super dark hair. And then as like two, three, four years old, she turned in, she developed red hair and she's a redhead yeah. and now. Yeah, so happen. yeah, she showed me her baby pictures. This was a while ago and I couldn't believe it. I was just, it, you would never know coming, you know, that she's a redhead 
um, that she was born with such dark hair. But um, yeah, and do you guys want to know the gender? We haven't really just made that decision yet. So we okay. have eight embryos. When you create your embryos, you get um, basically like they let the embryos grow until day five or six, okay. sometimes seven, depending on the embryo. They then run genetic testing to make sh make sure that they're genetically normal. Okay. And at that time, which is, this was wild to me, but at like day seven of the embryo growth, they can also determine the sex of the embryo. So that's soon. Already, that's yes. soon. Wow. So they give you those results. Alec has three male embryos and one female. I have all four male embryos. Um, so we are sort of destined to be boy dads, but we are holding out hope that we will hopefully have one of each. Um, oh, wow. But, but we haven't decided like who's going to go first, if we choose to use that one girl embryo first, or mm -hmm. if we go with a boy first, we'll see. That is wow. so exciting. That really is. So now you, do you have a surrogate now? Is that like the next step? No, that's the next step. So like when we started the process, this was 2020 two really when we started searching for an egg donor our agency elevate at the time told us that like as like we would do everything simultaneously like start looking for a donor and looking for a carrier because coming out of the pandemic there was this huge wait list to find a carrier by the time we actually got our embryos created which was back in september of 2023 so last year they were like are you guys ready because we could match you now like right now and we were like no <laughs> we're oh not gosh. quite there yet <laughs> yeah yeah so so there now we're at this point where it's like when we're ready we'll go into like the search process and it okay. won't they don't anticipate it taking that long so actually i think next month in june is when we're gonna officially kick off our search for a carrier and the hope is that we'll match in the summer and then do all the testing legal medical etc and be pregnant in the fall at some point um and that's just like based on our own like so my husband was a uh is an OBGYN and now in a fellowship program for this is riley my ginger cat oh, hi. Hi. Oh, hi, so happy. Look how happy she is. oh, oh my gosh eyes. beautiful eyes i know she has pretty eyes i think they're kind of like <laughs> green like much brighter green than mine but similar um and anyway so I, where was i so your husband is an OBGYN. He is, yeah. So he did a four-year med medical residency as an OBGYN. He's now doing a urogynecology fellowship. So he delivered like something like 800 ba 850 babies. Uh -huh. And now he's had enough and has moved on to <laughs> surgery. He does basically like he does hysterectomies, vaginal reconstructive surgeries, bladder surgeries. That's like the, the majority of what he does is so like women as they age or women after pregnancy, if they have issues with bladder control, uh, yeah. he does surgeries that like fix that. He like can wow. improve their lives like big time. Um, so it's kind of fascinating um, and yeah. very impressive. And I don't fully understand all the time what it is that he does, but it's like, <laughs> it's pretty cool. He, lo he loves his work. He really does. Redheads, have you heard? We aired on ABC Shark Tank, episode 14, season 15. We are busy developing products and continuing to grow this incredible redhead lifestyle brand. Check out our mascara and eyebrow products and red hot shades, hair care, merch, lifestyle items, and so much more. Redheads, we can now rejoice. Finally, there are products for us. Use code podcast to get 15% off your next purchase. Shop at shop.howtobearedhead.com. Wow, what a power couple. I just think that you guys know. just seem like you're going to be amazing, amazing parents. Um, and speaking of which, That's what are you looking forward to the most when you do have kids? Oh, I think I like I just it, like their little personalities developing, like because because I've, you know, I've closely watched my little nieces grow up and you know, right around, I guess it's around like 10 months where you really start to see like development. Not that I like want to rush those first 10 months, but seeing like that they notice you and like love you and like ask for their mommy and ask for their daddy and like all of the little nuances and like their personality developing and like getting to know them as like as friends almost like, yeah, even though they're our babies. 
I think that's what I'm most looking forward to. Yeah, it is really fun when their personality comes out. And even in the newborn stages, when they first smile and you're like, oh, my God, I see a little glimpse of your personality coming through. It is. Yeah. And then when or they're don't to- smile or don't smile like Bo stuff, he's not a big <laughs> smiler like Isla is. No, my yeah. My daughter like smiled out of the like, like, I don't even know how soon, but she's just so smiley. And then my yeah, my son is a little bit more. He's quick. He's not quick to smile at someone. Um, where she's just like, smile, smile, smile. <laughs> but yeah, it is. And it's so great. I will say like every stage is so different. And I know that your sister will agree, like having two little ones. And my advice is just embrace every stage. And it does get really great. It's so cool right now too, where like my son's three and a half and if it's just him and I, we have full on conversations like and it's just so cool to have like a little mini, you know, to just be like, oh, what do you want to do today? Oh, you want to do that? Oh, what do you want to eat? And then talk about like, how was your day at school? And yeah, it's just so exciting. And you're going to realize like every stage yeah, is so beautiful. I love that. That's really sweet. Yeah, no, I think I think I'm definitely on the same page there. <laughs> Yeah. So what, what's a common misconception that people have about surrogacy? I'm mm. sure. Cause I mean, you know, I, just as a woman, I thought about freezing my eggs. You know, I told Stephanie like a couple years mm-hmm. ago, I was like, you know, maybe, maybe like I'll change my mind in my forties and like, maybe I should just do the, do. And then I was like, oh wow, this is quite the procedure. Like, first of all, I don't want kids this bad. <laughs> like, oh my God, you have to do like the whole IVF and then you have it's to like lot. go in for it's surgery. I mean, it's not just like men. I'm like, if they want to just freeze their sperm, like what an oh. easier process. <laughs> oh, I mean, the, the whole thing is ridiculous. It, like our role in this process is so pathetically minimal. Like we just have to go to the clinic and do the thing one time and that's it. And it's it. like, it does not take very long and it does not disrupt our hormones for weeks and cause <laughs> right. potential like, oh my gosh. And and also just like from a financial standpoint, like donating sperm, like, it, it, this it's simplicity just so different. is it's it's very unfair. I fully acknowledge that. Um, yeah. But it's basically, our role besides decision making is done. It was done last year. You know, now it's all just begging for someone to help us along in this process. Um, wow. Misconception. I I want to say like come back to me in a year because I really feel like even though we're kind of at the halfway point, the first part is the as my my understanding the easier part of this like okay. having an egg donor creating embryos finding a carrier making sure that we have a connection with that carrier mm-hmm. that we're our values are aligned and then going through what can be a very tumultuous scary nine months or more depending on how everything goes like I, it's just there's just so much in front of us that I haven't even you know yeah thought there's- about and yeah, there's one a day lot at a un- time, one day at a time. And I, it's going to be yeah. Yeah. A, a journey. Yeah. And yeah. I know that your journey is so, you know, different than like my journey having children. But I will say there's so many unknowns throughout that nine, 10 months that it gave me a peace of mind to know. Yes, I know everything happens for a reason. But like what will I had a miscarriage prior to my son. And I feel like then after that, I was at such peace with knowing, okay, everything truly does happen for a reason, especially when I was pregnant with my daughter, because with my son, I was distraught, I think, thinking about the miscarriage. But then I would look at him as a newborn and be like, wow, I'm actually thankful that that happened in my life because yeah. now I have my beautiful son. So I only mentioned- And you probably mis- wouldn't have had Isla, Stephanie, like if that- Right. Pregnancy, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So I, yeah. I mentioned that just because there are so many unknowns, but kind of just- take it day by day and then know that it will all work out and it's going to be beautiful. Well, I am, I am so sorry to hear about that. Cause I can't, I really can't imagine what that is like, but uh, definitely a good perspective to have on the whole situation. Yeah. 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 And I, we were wondering too, like, are you going to share all of this journey on social I was gonna media? Ask like that. have you guys, yeah. Have you guys had like a conversation on how public you're going to be about and this? sharing and sharing your child? And that's like a big topic. Oh, that's that a know. whole other thing. Yeah. Yeah. We've we've had some conversations about 
that second part of your question, um, sharing our child, like when it comes to like social media, how we want them to show up, if they show up, TBD, we haven't gotten there. We haven't like made a decision one way or another. Mm. Um, I think, sorry if it's like a cop out answer, I think there will be like parts of our story that we, that are private for us and of parts course, yeah. that we're, we wanna share. I do think it's important for the, the process part of this, like this being finding a carrier and hopefully getting pregnant and having a baby that we wanna be as like upfront and transparent as possible. But what I will say is that I think there's a way to do that that is um, honest, but not necessarily timely. So for mm. example, like if we were to have a miscarriage we don't need to like let everyone know in that moment right. when we're yeah. grieving, when those when the carrier is grieving, and you know we don't we're questioning, and mm -hmm. I I think that there's a way to like be thoughtful about how what more likely when we communicate stuff like that. Yeah, um, but I do I'll, think yeah. but I think that people need to know about it. I think I think if something like that were to happen, we'd want to be transparent about it because it's 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 something that anyone else going down this road could also face. Yeah, I've really I never heard anyone, sorry, Steph, I've never heard anyone like speak so candidly about the process before. I do feel like mm -hmm. when Steph had her miscarriage, I remember she told me, she was like, no one talks about it. And I feel like it might be the same for this situation. Like how yeah. many people are in, you, in, in your shoes, Mike, and like they don't say anything, you know? And I just feel like I'm so happy that you're just so open about it because I'm learning and I'm sure like our listeners will be learning, but I didn't even know that it was this detailed. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's exactly right. And I think I, I wouldn't hold it against anyone for not sharing yeah. it and be so painful and, and mm. difficult. Um, but, but yeah, I, I've seen, you know, I've seen some of my like former colleagues when I used to work at Meta, for example, um, and just other friends of friends who, have been pretty vocal about like what they're going through as it's happening. Um, and I think it's important. I mean, I do think it's mm. another visitor. No, um, I do. I definitely do. Yeah. I think exactly what Adrian said too. It's like, I didn't share my miscarriage on social, but I shared it amongst friends and family, of course. And then to find out that like two relatives of ours had a miscarriage way back when, but they never, sh ne never, we never knew. And then to, finally sit down and like talk with other relatives about it and other friends who have ne had miscarriages will call me now to like, you know, um, because it's, it's something that they know that I've been through, but they can lean on me and ask me any questions. But that was something that I was thinking, are you followers? Have you received any like questions or DMS from followers that are also going through maybe what you and Alec are going through? Oh yeah. Lots. Yeah. I, that's part of it's a very validating yeah. uh, experience to get to get questions and get and unsolicited updates from people. People will be like, oh, my yeah. husband and I are at this stage and we're, we're doing this and we're thinking about you. And, um, no. you know, it's great to see that you're sharing this. And so that I mean, that that's the whole reason we do it. I, I think part two of the things that have been driving me most in terms of not, not just YouTube, but like being very public about this um, or about our lives, like. One was like going through residency with Alec was a very big challenge that I think that a lot of people don't really talk about. Mm. So we built a lot of content around that and we still are. Yeah. Um, and then this process too is, yeah. is challenging, unique, but also there are probably millions of people out there that are looking for answers and looking for a, commu a sense of community around this story. So that's why we're public about it. Yeah. And you must have a strong relationship. You know, I've been married 12 years and I can say that all of the tough times that we've had, mm -hmm. it has built us and we're stronger from it. But I feel like you guys have a very strong foundation to be going through this. I can just sense it talking to you that you have a solid, solid relationship. That's very kind. Absolutely. Like residency in particular, I don't know if you, you know of anyone who's, who's been no, through that. OBG, no, no. OBGYN residency is brutal like it is brutal and wow. it's four years long and there you have to deal with a lot of absence and loneliness and one mm. side of the couple is going to be the one that's doing the vast majority of the cooking and the cleaning and the planning and um and then the the other partner 
comes home and they're just exhausted. I mean, it, it really was a lot of stress. And I think if you can make it through a four-year residency as a couple, it's you, you absolutely have strengthened your relationship and you yeah. learn how to communicate in ways that people who don't have to do that, they just don't, they don't understand like the level of thoughtfulness and patience and communication that is needed to get through. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of my husband. Um, he was in the military. It kind of seems like yeah. it's a lot mm. like that. Like the, he's gone all the time. Um, it was four years, very long four years. <laughs> I couldn't wait yeah. for it to be over. <laughs> and um, yeah, we just got stronger from it. And I'm thankful because a lot of people don't. And um, now with any other hurdle that we have, like we just are like, we got this. Like it's nothing compared to that. So I can kind of understand, but I'm sure becoming a doctor, there's a lot of pressure. Oh, but I would say the same thing to you. Like, I'm sure the experience that you had was uniquely challenging in a way that I can't imagine. So yeah. for sure, though, but in the same way, it, it it's instructive and it, it makes you stronger and better. Yeah, it totally does. So um, not to jump gears, but we have to talk about your hair because I'm just staring <laughs> at it. I know. I it's love beautiful. To talk about my hair. I, it's um, beautiful. Jumping it's from beautiful. such a serious conversation to hair. <laughs> yeah. It's important. And and like honestly, like I am a novice. I I'm not I have been cutting my own hair since the pandemic pretty much. I've I've gone to a uh, hair cutter. You've stylist, been cutting like, your you hair. cut your own hair. I was gonna ask well, where you go. Wow. Well, so <laughs> I'm going I'm going today actually to my friend Kate Colhane in New York. She's great. And I'm going to ask her because this is the first time this like in the past few months, the first time I've really grown my hair out. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about being kind of scarred from my childhood of like yeah. being kind of shameful of my curly red hair. I'm starting to grow it out and like see how to work with it curly. So I'm I'm definitely gonna be asking Kate. And I also, of course, asked everyone on social media for all of their like curly hair products um, because I just don't know how to do it. I do not have the time to like diffuse. Like, I, I don't think I could do oh, it. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. But, that does like, take a lot of time. Getting some control, and some some proper products, like for my hair. But anyway, go. You you ask the questions, and I'll answer the best I can. So yeah, you have thick curly hair. What products do you use if you have a routine? And yeah, yeah what is your routine like? So I. It's, it's also very dry. So I mm. only wash like once a week. Um, or I'm, down to, I'm down to once a week and I condition a lot. Um, but I'm, I've been agnostic. Like I just don't, I don't have a product that I really like when it comes to hair, like shampoo and conditioner. Um, with what, what I will say is that I'm, I'm, I want a good, I think a good leave in conditioner. I think okay. that my hair just needs a lot of moisture. And I find that like when I try like the leave-in, that tends to be better for me. Um, and then lately what I've been using, a friend of mine suggested American Crew Fiber. It's like a pomade. That's what I use to like kind of tame the curls like as a yeah. product. That's really it. Uh, but I, like I said, when it comes to shampoo conditioner, I've been kind of agnostic. I haven't really... But that it's color is all yours. You don't enhance it. Not it you is have any beautiful. Whites. Nothing. Nothing. Wow. I promise. I've never. I tried. Wow. Like I told you. Like I was ashamed of it when I was younger. And I in college. So on the swim team, like the swimmers, we used to do crazy stuff with our hair. I actually like. I I'll have to like. I can try to find a picture if you want. But I we would always like because you shave your entire body when you swim competitively for a championship. So as part of that, we'd like people would like buzz crazy like hairstyles in and at one point I had like two red devil horns that were like my leftover <laughs> hair um my husband is like terrified of it he's like I don't ever want to see that picture um, <laughs> but yeah no the only time I think in, I think senior year of college I like tried to darken it or something as part of that like crazy like see what we can do with our hair but it it's tough to dye it like it doesn't take well to to color at yeah least mine. Yeah, red is really hard to dye. Exactly yeah. what you said. It's hard to take. Um, yeah, but your hair. Oh my gosh, I'm. It's like the perfect, perfect red. shade I mean, like, of it's red. Like so and you have rich. a very nice. You have a very nice hairline. 
Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, uh, <laughs> you that's all very, very kind. You you both also have gorgeous, gorgeous red hair. So. <laughs> We're like over here complimenting him. I'm Thank just staring you. at you. <laughs> and how, and, and we wanted to ask too about skin because we know that you play a lot of beach volleyball and then you've mentioned competitive swimming. So we're assuming that was inside and outside. Um, so do you do anything for your skin? Of course. Well, yeah. um, I wish I had been better yeah. when I was younger. Um, Don't we all? Like, yes. Yeah. Like, even though my parents were, well, I'll say my mother was very, very good about applying sunscreen as kids. But then I was like a swim coach outside for a bunch of years where I was not very good, if I'm being honest about sunscreen. And then into my 20s, when I started playing more volleyball, I've gotten better. Now, you know, in my 30s, I have a hat. I wear a ton of SPF, like, constantly. I'm, Same. you know, very, very vigilant about it. Um, but, no, you you have to be I, – I, I do wonder, and I don't know – I just don't know, like, the science behind it. I wonder if there's, like, a little bit of a difference if you're a redheaded Italian versus, like, mm. a true fair-skinned, you know, Irish-Scottish Italian – but that said, like, I know, like, my dad and my, my dad's twin brother had both had small, thankfully, curable, treatable can skin cancers that they've removed. Um, mm. You know, they're in their 60s and 70s. Um, but, yeah, I think, like, I'll use this opportunity now that we're speaking publicly on a podcast to say that, like, everyone should be wearing sunscreen, of course. I know. Redhead, yeah. fair-skinned people in particular. Um, yeah. And staying out of the sun when you can. I am addicted to beach volleyball and being at the beach. So, you know, it, it, it comes, it's tough to do, but I, I do find that like, at, like I've been very fortunate that at this stage of my life, as long as I'm applying and reapplying, I don't really burn. Like I, I am able to keep my skin pretty. Yeah. We, we, we have a routine like that too. Like Stephanie and I will talk and I'm like, I went through that whole trip and didn't get a sunburn. And like, we're both it's like, great. win, it's a win. Yeah. That is a win. That's like the yeah. highlight of my vacation. If that happens, especially if it's a beach <laughs> vacation. Cause my, my husband tans so beautifully. And then yeah. I'm over there seeking shade, trying to yeah. just put sunscreen on like every hour on the hour. So yeah. yes, it is a win when you leave a trip and you're like, yes, I didn't get sunburned. I, we need, we need the, um, FAA to, <laughs> like do away with the, the the liquid limit on when you pack your suitcases. I it know. really messes me up that I have to go buy sunscreen at every location. And I just had just my like, sunscreen taken from me from yeah. TSA last week, and I was and I asked the guy. I was like, I, I not that I was like argumentative, but I was like, you just took away my sunscreen. Like, isn't that something that people need? You know, like I like yes. as if like you know. I know my niece, she, she has to take peanut butter cause she's a type one diabetic, but like literally like you can like get really sunburned if you don't have it. He just Absolutely. looked at me. My husband's like, just throw it in the can. But I'm like, that was like $20. Just I know. Well, that's the thing. Like good sunscreens that you, that like I have pretty sensitive skin, so I like sensitive skin. So I like to use like a good sunscreen mm -hmm. and they're not cheap. Like they're not cheap. You like, that is something that I'm willing to spend money on. Like good sensitive sins sunscreen. That's going to protect me from the sun. Like, yeah. And then you have to go throw it away. So I'm, I'm always grateful when there's like 3.4 ounce versions of it that I can pack on trips. And usually I'll have a couple of them because I need a lot of reapplication. Yeah, I know. I know. I was wondering about your freckles too. Like, did, was that something that you had trouble embracing when you were younger or did you always love them? Um, I think I got enough compliments on them that I, I think that they kind of won out. Uh, yeah. I get a lot more in the summer, obviously, when I'm outside more. Yeah. My father is like one big freckle. He's just covered. <laughs> covered. Our dad, too. Our dad, too. Yeah. Steph's always like, Dad's so tan. I'm like, he just has one freckle. Like, that's well, one he, okay, so he's Italian, but I will say he does tan somewhat. It's he does. Like he, he, he's not. He, he's not like, yeah, he doesn't burn. He doesn't burn. But, but I think he was a pro golfer and like has golfed his whole life. Um he obviously never wore sunscreen, so maybe his skin just got used to being outside I mean, and, think, and turned into happens, one big yeah. freckle. Yeah, because you look at his arm and you do see just like massive freckles like all combined. combined. So <laughs> maybe that's, yeah. They grew, up, they grew up in that era. I mean, my dad brags about how they used to wear like olive oil, like they would put oil on their skin. It's insane. Oh my gosh. We would, 
Yeah. It's just like the dichotomy, the, the difference between how they went to the beach and how we go to the beach. It's like very, very different. It's so different. And then like how they raised kids, like our parents, there was sunscreen, but it wasn't so, okay, apply sunscreen. Like, like at my son's school, they recommend that you apply it before you drop them off because then they go outside within right. like an hour and a half. And I, I asked our mom, I was like, did you ever apply sunscreen to us before school or give it to school? Cause now you, you know, you can give it to it for them to do application in the afternoon. And she just, she was like, it, it's all a blur, but no, <laughs> we just went to school with all italian and portuguese anyway so we were like the only redheads in school were you mike like we were the only redheads there there actually was another um young redheaded italian in my class but other than that That yeah like that was it i mean very very few other ones i don't i don't even care remember i think it was me and him and that was it like in a in a school of about or in a class of about 200 people where did you guys grow up providence rhode island Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. I grew up in Northern Jersey. So okay. Very Italians, Italian community. But... <laughs> yeah. Yes. Only Italians. That was it. Yes. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it was such like a extra part of us being Italian was that we grew up with so many Italians. Like that was just like everyone. Sure. Like even to this day, I'm sure like when I saw your name, I was like, oh, I know how to say it. It's just like all the Italian yeah. names. We just like, it's just so yeah. a part of our growing up. Um, so speaking of Italy and all of that. So you guys are going to Italy soon. What are, do you have any like travel essentials that you bring on these trips or are you kind of just like, oh, whatever? Um, sunscreen, uh, mm-hmm. lots of it, good hats, good sunglasses when it comes to, you know, all the yeah. topics that we were just talking about. Um, we, we, we've become Kindle people. Uh, I used to like really oh. be, I was like such a proponent of having like a hard a cover book. book. Yeah. Like that you can hold. And I still on occasion, but we're really big Kindle people. Do you, so. I have to, I have to interrupt you. Cause I will just, I was just Googling Kindle the other day because Adrian recommended this book, um, by, I have it right over here by Colleen Hoover, November 9th. And Ooh. I rented it for, I got it from the library. Cause we always, we bring my son to the library quite a bit. So I grabbed it there. Well, then I was like 30 days late with it. And Thankfully, they got rid of fines during COVID or else like I would have be slammed with like a, it used to be a dollar. It was a dollar a day or no for something crazy. Oh. But anyway, I looked into getting a Kindle because I just really wanted to pick the book back up and it was going to take a few days to get um, on Amazon. So I'm only mentioning this because do you like your Kindle? I do. Yeah, I like yeah. it. I miss I miss having a, a book. A sometimes. book. I know. I, I like holding a book. But the, the Kindle is very convenient. I mean, you, you just can have go all through the so books. many books. That's what I, <laughs> yeah. I use my phone, which is like a terrible habit, but I just like Oof. buy everything on the Apple, on the Apple bookstore, which is yeah. so bad, but like, it's just so nice to just have it. And I have to tell you when I'm on a trip, I fly through books. I'm like, Oh, here's another book. And I love reading the reviews and like all that stuff, but I should just do a Kindle. So it's like separate from my phone. Cause I don't like when yeah. you get that notification they're like, you're up 12% this week. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. No, (laughs) I need to be down 12%, not up. (laughs) Get it. Um, So tell us, you have so much. We know you have so much to look forward to, but in terms of your content creation, like what are your goals next? And like, what what are you looking forward to the most? I mean, you have a lot to look forward to, but. Mm -hmm. That's very kind. Uh, I I think like, I'm definitely excited about as we start the next stage of the baby process, like, having a lot more to say. Um, Mm. And I know some of it will probably be pretty tough and challenging, but I also think that's going to make it interesting. And, and that's the important part for people to hear. Um, And then I don't know, I mean, like, I don't have like a niche, really. I don't really have an agenda. It's stuff just kind of comes to us sometimes. And we when we work with it. Um, I do say that Alec is really the star, like, most of my content without him isn't doesn't really perform as well or like people don't really care and he's actually like a really good actor and I think the reason for that is there's there's a lot of truth in his performing Mm. so like when we make stuff about for example about residency and like how tough it is and like he has to be kind of like pretend to be like a little bit like stressed out and despondent or something he can nail that because he knows it so well yeah Uh, (laughs) but 
Yeah, I, I, I'd love to do more travel content. Mm. Um, like, I, I like to... I love food. I love, like, a really... Like, I love nice hotels and... and Same. Anything, Same. anything near yeah. water. Um, so, I don't know. I just... What, uh, there's no, like, real um, real plan for it, but just excited to see what, you know, the last 18 months of being dinks brings us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, well, enjoy it, and we can't wait to see everything that you guys do. It's going to be so fun. I can't wait to follow you in Italy, too. I hope that you I post know. so we can see everything I, that you're up to. Yes. Thank you both. Uh, this has been so, so fun. Thank you so Thank much you, for coming on. Mike. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.